I confess, I masturbate before spending time with my mom pretty much every time. I know it sounds creepy, but it is the only way to find my happy place and avoid getting yelled at, strangling, or flat out bitch slapping her. <laughs> she knows this. <laughs> So now I no longer have to explain why I'm always late. <laughs> Way to manage it. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> this podcast is intended for those 18 and over. If that's not you, please check out scarletine.com and come back to this podcast when you are of age. Thank you for listening to the Bedpost Confessions podcast. Bedpost Confessions is an Austin, Texas-based monthly reading and performance series about sex, sensuality, and the steamy side of life. Between performers, we ask audience members to anonymously submit anything worthy of a confession, which is then read aloud by one of our producers. The performance you're about to hear by James Dean Jaybird was recorded on March 21st, 2013. A quick note to our listeners. Jay's piece exemplifies how painful childhood memories surrounding sex and family can produce feelings of shame and guilt. And often, art is a way we release these emotions so others can too. After all, sex can be powerful and beautiful, but it can also sometimes be difficult and dangerous. Bedpost Confessions is proud to support all of our stories, from the sublime to the wretchedly honest. Without further ado, here is James Dean Jaybird reading For Shame. I saw the Steve McQueen film Shame recently. I'll avoid spoilers, but I will tell you it's sexy and dark. Momentum Pictures says shame examines the nature of need, how we live our lives, and the experiences that shape us. My shame ranges from the banal to the horrific. I'm ashamed that I'm not more educated. I'm ashamed of my sexuality. I'm ashamed of my family. I'm ashamed of my depression. Questions. How do I tell my mother that her younger brother tried to rape me when I was 16, the summer after my father died? How can I be completely honest about that situation without admitting I was attracted to him? How dare I cry rape when at the age of 11 I was willingly seduced into another uncle's bed by his roommate? And how do I explain that my relationship with that uncle, her big brother, continued on and off for 21 years? After shame, it dawned on me that the relationship I had with that uncle continued because of what happened to me at college. I told my uncle the story, and he didn't reject me. He loved me like no one ever had. I saw my arrival at college as an escape from fundamentalism. The university was only 88 miles from home, but I felt like I'd discovered a new planet. Unfortunately, I took along some baggage from the home planet. Early the first semester, I got caught sneaking out of the library with a reference book containing a section on homosexuality. I hid it in the middle of my school books, not realizing that when I passed through the exit, all hell would break loose. Red lights swirling, sirens howling. What followed was a series of embarrassments. The discovery of the book by the student librarian. Interception by an adult staffer. A written report of my transgression, including a statement that I was likely trying to remove the item surreptitiously because of the subject matter. Homosexuality was still bookmarked. I was also scheduled to see an off-campus therapist, which I was excited about. I would be cured, paid for by the state, thank you very much. <laughs> Nobody the wiser. But after a couple of sessions, I wrote in my journal, this therapist lady is a quack. Instead of helping me be normal, she expects me to be okay the way I am. My roommate, Chris, seemed like an okay guy. Looking back, he was probably a sociopath. He said he missed high school football a lot, but also said he was happier in college because he could focus more on auto mechanics and marijuana. I didn't smoke the devil's weed, but didn't report him like I should have either because he turned me on. 
which I believed was the greater offense. Chris rarely wore more than boxer shorts in our room, and he left those on the bed when going to and from the shower, letting me know he knew I was looking. Shortly after the lights went out, I often heard him drooling into his palm and jerking off. I would lie there terrified. One evening, when I walked in from theater class, Chris threw back the covers and insisted I look. He had one of those plastic wine cups over his dick and balls, like a science exhibit. It had a sort of fetus in formaldehyde appearance, only way hotter. <laughs> I gulped and looked away. He savored the power he had over me, but as is the sociopath's nature, eventually Chris crossed the line. In the second semester, he started sneaking out of our room with my journals. He and the other guys on our floor would squeeze into the dorm room next to the staircase and take turns reading aloud. I know because I caught them. Well, I discovered them. I heard my words mocking me through the door, but did nothing. Brian was my best friend in college. He was super skinny with curly blonde hair. His parents were as old as my grandparents, and they were Jewish, which made him exotic to me. <laughs> he thought the fact that I had spoken in tongues exotic. The two of us shared a twisted sense of humor. Brian drove his parents' Oldsmobile, a sun-bleached gold behemoth with mile-wide patina green seats. He drove me all over hill country looking at golf courses. His plan was to move to California after freshman year, join the UCLA golf team, and become famous, like Jack Nicklaus. <laughs> I decided I would move to California, too, and go to the Burt Reynolds Institute for Film Theater and become famous, like Burt Reynolds. Brian liked my idea as much as I liked his, and so California became our shared goal. We made plans while traveling the two-lane blacktops around Central Texas. I sang along with the new wave songs on the radio, and Brian smiled fondly at me from behind the wheel. One of our rides was particularly journal-worthy. It was a sunny fall afternoon. The windows were down. The radio was up. Brian's left hand was draped casually at the wrist over the steering wheel. His right hand rested on the seat between us. Slowly, like a big white spider, his hand sneaked across the faded green expanse. The knack was on the radio. Come a little closer, huh? Oh, will you, huh? Close enough to look in my eyes, Sharona. Keeping it a mystery. Gets to me. Running down the length of my spine, Sharona. Never gonna stop. Give it up. Such a dirty mind, I always get it up. For the touch of the younger kind. My, 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 my eye. Woo! Ba -ba 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 -bum 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 -ba. My, 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 Sharona. Brian pushed the gas pedal to the floor and we flew over a sharp hill. Butterflies exploding from our bellies. I closed my eyes, leaned against the headrest and snaked my hand across the seat until cold flesh touched cold flesh. It was oh so brief. And then it was over. I opened my eyes. Brian had both hands on the wheel. I sat up straight. Brian didn't look, didn't speak. He was smiling, but not fondly. Still, I reported in my journal that it was only a matter of time, and I would remain patient. During the holidays, I announced my plans to my mother, not mentioning Brian, of course. She liked my idea because she liked Burt Reynolds. <laughs> and she felt being rich and famous was a worthy goal. <laughs> Previously, when I've told people the story of hearing my journal being read, I've always said the door was locked. But I didn't even turn the knob. As my words, my shame, their nervous snickers, the distinctive golly from David, whom I'd known since eighth grade, filtered through the door. I just stood there. I should have reported them, but I'd already escaped conviction on charges of queerness once before, so it seemed best not to. I tried a subtler tactic. I went crazy. Or tried to make it look like I was crazy. Or possessed. Or too unstable to be held accountable. In the middle of a journal entry, I switched the pen to my left hand. My handwriting disintegrated into a scrawl. The letters grew larger and larger until the words were a quarter page tall. You think I can't see you? I'm watching you right now. Spring sprang, and excitement was airborne like pollen. For me, the excitement was California, Brian, fame, and fortune. 
My notebooks had stopped disappearing, so I assumed interest had waned and things had returned to normal. But I arrived from class one day to an eerily quiet dormitory. In the back of my mind, a, a voice told me to worry. Like in a made-for-TV movie, all evidence of the crime pointed to me. I sat on the edge of the bed, staring at nothing, listening to nothing. The phone rang. I ignored it, but it wouldn't stop. Or rather, it did stop, only to start again. It was Brian. California's off. What do you mean? I mean, California's off. We read your diary. What are you talking about? I can't believe some of the things you said in there. I don't know what you're talking about, Brian. Yes, you do, Jay. What you wrote in your diary about me, about us. What diary? I'm just calling to say I'm not going to California with you or anywhere. You got it? So just forget about it. As calmly as I could muster, knowing that 20 eyes were focused on me through the blinds, I walked to the parking lot, got into my car, turned the key, and drove. At the interstate, I headed north. How would my life end? A ditch? An overpass? Maybe I would drive under this 18-wheeler. That would show them. 80 miles an hour, 90. A chase would make the inevitable easier. But I didn't even seem to matter to the state troopers. I hit 100, then pulled over and cried on the shoulder of the interstate until the sky turned black. I didn't even have the courage to die and make those assholes feel bad. I spent the rest of freshman year a zombie, not speaking, except sometimes when spoken to. David approached me a week after the phone call to say the guys were worried about me. I said, don't be. He seemed relieved. David was there in the eighth grade when the jocks started taunting me in the hallways and calling me gay bird because I carried my school books wrong. David wasn't a name caller, but he also never stood up for me, which made me think he must have known all along. I failed all of my classes, except theater, which seems a cruel epilogue since I wasn't going to California anyway. <laughs> Besides, Burt Reynolds School is in Palm Beach, Florida, not Palm Springs, California. <laughs> <laughs> so, I moved in with my uncle, who was going through a second childhood, snorting lots of cocaine. His toupee stylist was a dealer. My uncle's red-headed second cousin and I made brownies with the weed my uncle supplied and ate them while smoking from a cock-shaped bong filled with peppermint schnapps. <laughs> we drank shivas and soda. Smoked cigarettes with pretentiously long names. Mine were Benson and Hedges, Deluxe Ultralights, Menthol 100s. <laughs> they introduced me to bookstores, the kind with more glory holes than books, where we spent weekends, as was the nature of our kind. My uncle wasn't rich. He made good money, but spent it just as fast as he earned it on out-of-town trips, theater, three-star restaurants. In exchange, I sometimes returned the favor in bed. Eventually, it felt wrong, so I got a job, an apartment, and started hanging out at New Wave Clubs. I had girlfriends who adored me and drug-induced nocturnal explorations with guy friends, neither of which felt totally right. Then I was married for a spell to a woman 17 years my senior. Her son, on whom I'd been crushing for a while, introduced us. She and I were both bisexuals. He thought our introduction might deflect my interest in him. He didn't count on us getting married. The marriage wasn't so much a farce as a cautionary tale. <laughs> if you're a young man questioning your sexuality, a bipolar woman is probably not the best person to become entangled with. <laughs> the reason we tied the knot was because of my job. My insurance package was pretty fucking hot. <laughs> the biggest health benefit to come from the marriage, though, was the cure of my indecisiveness. I made my way to New York City and came out big. AIDS was everywhere I was, but I didn't care because I didn't matter. Somehow, miraculously, I dodged the gay scarlet letter while men all around me, less promiscuous than I, dropped like houseflies. <clears throat> Fast forward to 2005, after a 10-year relationship, a career that edged toward fame and fortune, life on the road with a third partner. I was alone in Nashville, 
trying to reconcile and rectify my life, and decided to move west. I stopped on the home planet for a couple of months while my grandmother died. We held daily vigils, sang hymns, prayed, and waited. My evolution put my mother on the defensive, so I spent most of my time meditating, which was an affront to her spiritual sensibilities, even though she hadn't been particularly spiritual since my father died. Along came Hurricane Katrina to pit us against one another even more, this time in the arenas of compassion and cause and effect. Fed up, I decided to spend a couple of nights with my uncle, her big brother. His life also had had plenty of twists and turns. His long-term partner had died in the past year, as had his cousin years earlier, of AIDS. Still, we managed to reminisce fondly about the fruits and nuts that grew on our family tree. <laughs> at bedtime, my uncle stood at the door of the guest room, hemming and hawing, his hesitance palpable, like a child trying to work up the courage to ask for a toy. He confessed that he missed having someone to sleep next to. Next thing you know, I was crawling into his bed. I tried falling asleep while he pulled me close. His groping hands produced an erection, and with no more invitation than that, he mumbled something and went for a Viagra. I rolled onto my back and stared at the portrait of him and his lover in matching sweaters, smiling down at me. The faucet ran, he peed, flushed, and as he plodded back up the hallway, duty and dread hovered over me like a hangover. My uncle pushed his medical miracle between my legs and humped me, sucked my neck, turned my face, and kissed me lovingly. I complied, but wasn't fully present. I was 11 years old, being told that after my uncle fucked him, the roommate, then I could. I was 16, tumbling drunk down an embankment, the youngest uncle tugging my ass out of my jeans. I want to butt fuck you, please. I was 18. Brian was hanging up the phone. Just forget about it. Got it? I was 19. I was 23, 25, 30. I was sucking off guys in public restrooms, on subway platforms, in sticky black closets, foregoing condoms, certain I'd already gone too far, so who gives a fuck? Was this volunteer work, this sex with my uncle? Was this love? It felt like shame. The same shame that washed over me after Steve McQueen's film ended. I liked the film, by the way. I thought it was well made, thought provoking. I liked how slowly it moved. So slow as to imitate life. The way the painful parts seemed like they might never end. Is going to happen? That's the shame I'm talking about. Thanks for listening. Your empathy is the antidote. James Dean Jaybird started writing around the age 13. He moved to New York City at 24, wrote plays, one of which starred RuPaul, and songs for a musical duo which landed him on Comedy Central and Jon Stewart's first show on MTV. Jay finds many outlets for performing in Austin, from traditional to experimental theater to an improvised disco band. His upcoming solo show is called, spoiler alert, This Is How My Life Ends. Bed Post Confessions is produced by myself, Mia Martina of the I Want Your Sex podcast at MiaOnTop.com, Sadie Smythe of That's What Sadie Said.com, Julie Gillis of JulieGillis.com, and Rosie Q of SayPrettyBird.blogspot.com. Podcast audio production by Ian Danskin at InnuendoStudios.com. You can find links to all of our websites and more information about Bed Post Confessions at BedPostConfessions.com. You can also confess with us at Bedpost Confessions on Facebook and Bedpost Confess on Twitter, where we tweet audience confessions. Chime in and add yours. Until next time, we'll leave you with a few other confessions from the audience. I confess when I go to metal shows, 
I purposefully stand next to the PA bass speaker and let the vibrations tickle my clit while I look at the band rock out. Rock out, indeed. I literally jam out with my clam out. One time, I got myself off. (laughs) I confess, I met a girl who hadn't had sex in six years. For some reason, I've been very tired lately. Yeah. I confess... I recently fucked a girl against her Dodge Neon. In broad daylight. In public. It's the only time I've been pleased to be seen in the vicinity of a Dodge Neon. Well played. 